Welcome to my talk called VM Mapping Out Zoom Virtual Memory. <clears throat> so compared to some of the other talks today, this is going to be more like um, operating system internals with a bit of vulnerability research and maybe some exploitation at the end if there's time. But most of the focus of this talk is going to be, as I say, virtual memory internals in XNU. So hopefully, if there's some of you from like a forensics background, either this is all very old news or hopefully interesting. There's definitely a lot of interesting vulnerability research that can be done in this area, and also just the sort of high-level, terrifying view of um, the legacy craft that lies underneath all of my uh, shiny things. So uh, you can't have any XNU talk without an uh, obligatory slide about what is XNU. We have on the left-hand side here, Mach, and on the right-hand side, BSD. Why do these exist next to each other? Well, they wanted to have this very nice old microkernel, but this microkernel can't do things like open a file or have a network stack. Mach just doesn't have those things. So what Darwin did was take BSD on one side and Mach on the other side and sort of glue them together. So actually, this is struct task, which is the Mach abstraction for a task for a process. In the Mach world, that's called a task. And in the BSD world, uh, it's called a process. And literally, they just point to each other. So a Mach task has this BSD info, this is just a void star, because Mach doesn't know anything about BSD, and that points to the struct proc in the BSD world. Vice versa, the BSD <coughs> struct task, the struct proc rather, has a task field which points to the Mach world. This is all irrelevant to what we're going to talk about already. So they both have complete, they both have separate responsibilities in terms of the areas of the system that they manage. So on the Mach side, we had Linus's talk earlier about Mach ports and about how Mach port names can be difficult to use. And that all lives under this ITK space, which is the per task, not per process, per task, way of mapping port names to writes. So it's what goes from minus 41, 42, or whatever port name, to uh, struct uh, IPC port. Um, and then you have a similar abstraction in the BSD world for file descriptor numbers, right? So you have file descriptor numbers, which go from a number, which is just the index in your per process table, to a file blob structure, which is similar, the similar kind of abstraction level to an IPC port. A bunch of other stuff, so, you know, Martha deals with threads, BSD does with process groups and credentials and loads of other stuff. And Mach is responsible for VM map. So on iOS, Mac OS, the virtual memory management is done on the Mach side. It's not BSD's memory management interface. Memory management code, although you can use the BSD memory user space memory management uh, interface. To, to manage user space, user memory, but it's really all implemented on the Mach side. And if you look at the BSD uh, syscalls that you would use to allocate memory, they all just end up, they're just quite short uh, stubs which call over into the Mach side of the kernel. So this does memory and this one. <clears throat> so what's the fundamental thing that I'm going to talk about? Message passing. This is this fundamental microkernel idea, and it's important to point out iOS, GNU, macOS. This is not a microkernel in any way, but nevertheless, it has the legacy background of some of it used to be a microkernel. So it's dragged all of this stuff with it, even though whether they actually gain much benefit from it now is debatable. Um, but the idea with message passing is that. You split up all your functionality into different user space processes, was the idea then, and these all have just the minimal level of privilege that they require, and they all talk to each other by sending you know, little envelopes with messages in them. Um, and the idea, well, it was thought, it's probably true, that the major sort of reason that no one ever took these micro kernel architectures that far, that there are systems that do use them, but <clears throat> your iPhone is not a real microkernel. Um, 
this is thought to be like a major performance bottleneck, the fact that you have to copy memories all the time to make anything happen. And so this talk is about how Mach use, uses virtual memory tricks to make being able to pass these uh, Mach messages fast and how actually when you look at how it works, it was quite broken. So Linus already mentioned uh, Mach messages. I think everyone in the audience is probably very familiar with what a Mach message is. So we're going to go very quickly over this. Um, the fundamental unit of a Mach message, in user space at least, is this 24-byte structure. This is the smallest possible Mach message you can send. And <clears throat> the only thing that we are interested in here is this single bit there. This is the complex bit, the most significant bit, the first B word. And this is going to tell us, is this message complex, the bit is one, or simple, the bit is not one. If it's complex, then following this header structure in memory, this kernel is going to look for another D word called, confusingly, body. But this is not the body of the message. This is actually a count of how many structures similar to this will follow before you get to the body. But I don't know. It's called body for, for, for some reason. And then after these, these structures come the actual inline message body. So we'll come back to what a uh, mock message out of line descriptor actually is. But for now, what we really need to know is that in this message, you tell it how big your message is, and it's how big the, this actual entire buffer is you want to copy into the kernel, and then the kernel can copy to the recipient. You said where you want to send the message to, in terms of this is a mock port name that you have some kind of write over. And then you can also put other ports in there. And by convention, you can use the local port to transfer a receive, transfer a sendable write normally to a reply port. And there's also a voucher port, which the last time I gave a talk, this was this was um, like undefined what was in there. And then a few macOS releases ago, they put the voucher port in this field. So <clears throat> the important thing here is when you send a message, this entire structure and this inline message body, you, this could be hundreds of megabytes. That's a, a, a very unlikely to find an example. It could be hundreds of megabytes, but it, the system completely supports that. And every time you want to send one of these messages, normally to another user space process or to the kernel, there's a lot of memory copying that goes on. So there will be a kernel heap allocation made that's the same size, but slightly larger than this message buffer. The message buffer will be copied in from user space to the kernel, processed, and then copied out into user space or the recipient. <clears throat> and so, yeah, there is an awful lot of memory copying going on here. And <clears throat> back in the early 80s, when this was being written, um, memory copying was even slower than it is now. I mean, very slow. And so you want to make your thing fast. You want to avoid copying these large amounts of data. And so how do you avoid copying large amounts of data? You can use virtual memory magic. So to look at this message here, rather than having an enormous inline message body, what you can instead do is tell the system, actually, here's just my virtual memory address of the region of memory I want to send. Here's how big it is. Here's some flags. Don't make this happen for free. And specifically, what you want to do is if you set these are flags here, if you set the copy flag to zero, are you saying, I don't want you to make a copy of this memory for the recipient. In fact, what I also want you to do is not make a copy and deallocate it from my address space. And you make sure that the address is page aligned and the size is page aligned then what the Mach VM subsystem is able to do is actually take that entire virtual memory region, pull it out of your process, and push it directly into the recipient, completely avoiding the need to actually copy the contents of all of the pages. Yeah, so setting these, these bits implies move semantics should apply to the underlying virtual memory. <clears throat> and the idea is this can be fast. So, how does this work? So we need to look at a little bit of Mark's virtual memory internals 
and the kernel managed data structures that make all the flash. So as we looked at before, this struct's task is the high level abstraction of a task. And the task has a virtual memory map, which is a struct VM map. Your struct VM map then contains pointers into a per process linked list of virtual memory map entries. I say linked list. <laughs> This can be either in the linked list or a red black tree. And essentially, the linked list version is easier to think about, but the red black tree is the one that's actually used in practice. Um, and really, this is just an entry which covers every single valid virtual memory uh, virtual memory region in your task. <coughs> so for each address that could be dereferenced, if the dereference is going to succeed, it's covered by one of the virtual memory map entries in this list, or actually red map tree. Those VM map entries themselves first contain their W linked list pointers, so you can go forwards and backwards. If you want to, for example, grab all of the virtual memory map entries covering a region that's spanned by multiples of these, you can start at the first one and iterate through the list until you've grabbed all of them that cover the entire region. So each map the entry then tells you, here's the virtual address that I represent the start of, and I represent the end of, so I'm responsible for everything in between start and end. And then finally, at the end, you actually have the pointers into the object that actually tells you <coughs> how to get contents for the pages. And finally, what offset in that object do I start getting my memory from? And then the last of our abstraction that we'll look at is what do those objects themselves look like? So they start off with this men q pointer, and this then finally is a pointer into the linked list of are they linked list? Yes. Of um, VM pages. And there is one VM page for each physical page of physical memory that can be allocated like this. So these are then the pages that are currently resident, i.e. actually their contents is in RAM um, for that object. And it's very likely that the object <coughs> has far, represents far more memory or has far more contents than is actually currently in physical memory. But this is the stuff that's in physical memory. And then these other three fields here, this pager, paging offset, pager control, are then the way that you can get the VM object to either give physical pages back or go and request more contents to put into physical pages. Um, and then finally, you can also nest these structures. So rather than having a virtual memory map entry pointing directly into an object, which could be, for example, be a file, you can instead point into another map. In this way, you can nest between processes different virtual memory maps. So now that we've looked at a few of these structures, let's look at actually the implementation of how this optimized move operation is supposed to work. So on the left, we have a sender task, and on the right we have a receiver task. So mm -hmm. sender wants to send a mock message to receiver, and it wants to, in that message, move some portion of its address space to the receiver. So the way this works, as we have already mentioned earlier, these messages <coughs> in most cases are actually being enqueued into the kernel, and then only when the receiver actually tries to dequeue the message will they be copied into the receiver. So actually they have this limbo state where they uh, the messages live in the kernel. And so the structure that's going to contain the VM map entries which we are putting in this limbo state is called a VM map copy, which is like a VM map, but it's just there for containing stuff which is being copied, like VM map entries which are being copied around. So this is how it's supposed to work. You take your source virtual address space, which is this linked list repository of 
um, virtual memory map entries, you find the start and the end of the region that you want to move, and you move them into the copy. And then later on, when the receiver receives this, it walks through the VM map entry, its VM map entry list, finds a place to put them, and then copies those entries, well, copies the contents of those VM map entry structures into new VM map entry structures in there. And so notice that that's taken some of the virtual address space of this process on the left, the sender, and moved it into the receiver. And at no point did anyone have to mem copy the contents of that memory. You just moved you know, one abstraction or a few abstraction layers higher. You just moved the data structures around and magically you've done the equivalent of malloc mem copy in the target. So, <clears throat> what's wrong here? Well, what you have to first <clears throat> appreciate is that this works, or this is supposed to work, because what you're trying to do is move the memory. You're not trying to make a copy of the memory. There exist things like copy and write, which this bug has got nothing to do, but would be a different way of achieving um, the same effect, or a similar effect, a, a low overhead way to copy memory around. But this is not a copy and write style thing. This is an optimized move of memory. So it's important then that the operation of finding the correct VM map entries and copying them into the VM map copy and then removing them from the task all needs to be atomic. And we'll see exactly why it needs to be atomic later on, but hopefully it should be relatively clear that things are going to go very badly wrong if it's not atomic. So in order to understand how that might be enforced, um, you need to understand the ownership semantics or the lifetime semantics of all of these objects. So these VM map entries are owned by their VM map, and this is enforced by the VM map lock field. So you can only do everything that you do with a VM map entry, you must hold the corresponding VM maps lock at all times. If you don't hold that lock, then something else could come in and destroy the VM map entry that you are currently um, using. And it's almost certainly very, very wrong in a very bad way if that doesn't happen. And I think that class of bug was actually audited by someone. Well, someone audited for that class of bug because there are many, many, many places where it's almost there, but it's not quite there. So well done for Apple, whoever audited for that bug. But it's more subtle than that. So <clears throat> let's look first at how that lock is actually used. So, yeah, and aside on locking in the VM subsystem, avoiding deadlocks is a hard problem, is what it says there, and uh, it is a hard problem. So this is their macro for taking the VM map lock. So I have to find VM map lock map, some very long function lock, read, write, lock, exclusive map lock. It doesn't matter for the moment what this actually does, but that all looks like a fairly standard way to take a lock, you know, call something with lock in it. So let's look at VM map unlock. The VM map unlock is slightly more curious. And then before doing the unlock, it bumps up this timestamp counter and then drops the lock. Um, and this is a view of Texas UT. Not really relevant for the bug I'm going to talk about, but very relevant for why none of this is really fixed. So why do they even have that timestamp counter there and what's it being used for? Remember, avoiding deadlocks is a hard problem. So let's look at an example case of usage of vmmap.timestamp. So what they might do while they hold the lock is make a local copy of map timestamp without marking the symbol of that. Then drop the lock on the map, go do some stuff, take the lock on the map again, and then check where the last timestamp plus one is equal to the current timestamp. And if it's not, uh, do some stuff, otherwise continue. So what is actually going on here? 
Well, really what they're saying is, I'm about to do something here for which I am not, for which I, there may be deadlocks or even worse things if I hold the lock on this map. Therefore, I'm just going to drop the lock, do some stuff, and then I'm going to try and check if anyone raced me. And if anyone raced me, then they would have taken the lock and dropped the lock. And on dropping the lock, they would have bumped the map's timestamp up, at which point I'm going to now have to try to recover, because everything I thought I knew up until this point about the structure of the DM map may no longer be true. So find the entry again. It could have been clipped after we unlocked the map. Yes, you have to go reset everything. And you can think about why this might be so pervasive. Well, this is the virtual memory subsystem. And it turns out that the virtual memory subsystem sometimes has to allocate virtual memory. And it can't really hold a global lock on itself while it's trying to put more memory into itself. Yeah. It's, it's, it's non-trivial without some severe thinking how to like, generically fix this kind of thing. And this, this construct is everywhere. And so it should be kind of clear where the bug is going to be. The bug is going to be, well, in this window, do some stuff which requires the map to be unlocked. Then, did someone race us? Well, OK, we detected that someone raced us, so we need to reset our expectations about the state of the world and try again. And it's obviously in this, let's reset what we don't think we know about the world, <coughs> where the bugs are going to be. So we'll look more accurately then at a case where they are failing to accurately reset what they believe the state of the world should be in regard to, in this case, a virtual memory operation which is supposed to have new semantics. So <clears throat> let's take this task on the left, and we want to send this shaded region in a VM map copy to another task. We want to send it in a map message. So we start with the VM map unlocked, and for our VM map copy object, we allocate one VM map entry hanging off of the copy. And these VM map entries come from Calloc, so the generic kernel zone allocator, um, for which we cannot hold the VM map lock because we may well be. Moving this, this task could be the kernel task, or it could be the VM map from which that stuff comes. So we, we can't hold the lock. <clears throat> so, but we upfront allocate one VM map entry. Then we take the lock from the VM map and we copy the contents of this first VM map entry into our copy of the VM map entry. And so now the contents are still there in here, and they're still present in the VM maps um, link list of VM map entries, but the lock is held there, so no one can come in and mess with this. Then, with the lock still mapped, we iterate through to the next VM map entry that we want to copy. And if there was one, i.e., if we haven't yet reached the end of the virtual memory region that we want to copy, well, we only allocated upfront for one of these things, and we're actually going to need some more. And remember, if we need more, we need to drop that lock, because we can't hold the lock when we make a power allocation. So what are you going to do? We're going to record the timestamp. We're going to drop the lock. We're going to allocate a new VM map entry onto our uh, list in the VM map copy. Then we're going to take the lock again. And then we're going to see, does 100 plus 1, our timestamp when we drop the lock, plus 1 equal the current VM map timestamp. Did anyone race us? I mean, it, this is not purely detecting, did anyone like maliciously race against us? This just means, really, did anything else happen which modified the state of the map? And don't think about what might have happened if it modified the state of the map 4 billion times and the timestamp exploded. That's not the bug, but that is a bug. Um, so 
But if it does match, so if the time, if it appears that either no unlocks happened or four billion or whatever unlocks happened, then we will not race. Therefore, we can continue back up to the head of the loop here. We hold the lock. We've got a new VM map entry, and we can copy the contents and move on. So the question is, what if the timestamp doesn't match? And this is the point where we need to reset our expectations about the state of the world. Well, the VM map could have changed, and it could be the case that the VM map entry for which we had a pointer is, has been freed, and that pointer is no longer valid. So we need to go and look up the VM map entry, which now covers the remainder of the virtual address region that we are trying to copy. So we do a fresh lookup of the next VM map entry to copy, and then we continue along in the loop. So we take the contents of now this second purple one here, and we copy the contents of it into the VM map entry, and repeat all the way down until we've covered the whole region. And then finally, once we've copied all of the contents over into the VM map copy, we remove the VM map entries from the source task. And so this is really the list pointing to the next field of this one, now points ahead to this one, and this points back there. It's a similar thing in the red black tree, but make them all wake up quickly. So <clears throat> what's wrong here? The problem is this is supposed to be a completely atomic move operation. If you are an observer of the VM map, you should only ever be able to see two states. You should either see the whole virtual memory region is in there, in the source, or the whole virtual memory region is gone. And if you can ever interact with the map in an intermediate state between those two, and this is no longer an atomic operation, and we will see what is going to go wrong if it's not a real atomic operation. So let's look at what might happen. Because it should be clear that this is clearly not an atomic operation, because at some point that lock goes red, and the lock is dropped. There we go. Yes. So if the timestamp doesn't match, then it's not enough to just invalidate this pointer, which points to the next VM map entry to copy, we also have to go back and reset everything that we've done previously here. Because someone, because we never removed this VM map entry from the source. We only removed the entries right at the end of the operation. So when we reset the state of the world, we need to reset everything we've done. And that's basically what the... You can also see this in the source, but it's kind of clearer here. But really, in the source, it's like you need to go back one loop, one nested loop higher. So you can't just go back and fetch this current entry you're working on. You need to go back and refetch all the entries. So what concretely bad could happen? Well, let's imagine that while the map is unlocked, so while the map is unlocked and one copy has already been made, and we are busy making a calloc zone allocation for the next VM map entry, someone else, another thread with access to the VM map, comes along and decides, well, how about I also perform an optimized move operation at the same time? So then there's going to be this second VM map copy which again has a VM map entry. And then this second one is going to start at the beginning of the virtual address space. See that this um, grayed out uh, VM map entry, the contents are still intact because the contents were just copied into our original VM map entry copy. So it's going to copy the contents of this one into this second VM map copy. <clears throat> and now they're going to like both contend on this lock and kind of thrash around. But what you're actually going to end up with are two VM map copies that, if the locking works out, and actually the locking pretty much always works out if you correctly craft the VM map um, setup, 
you're going to have two VM map properties, which both believe they are atomic moves of Wettermann and regions, when in fact they both have the same underlying um, VM map entries, which map to the same VM map objects and offsets. And we'll see exactly what the consequences of that are uh, in a little bit. So how do you actually set something like this up to do something interesting? So <clears throat> this diagonal set of boxes, again, is the virtual address space of your process. This being a low address up to a higher address. And what we're going to create are out-of-line descriptors. So those are these descriptors which enable you to take a big bit of virtual memory and put it in a message and move it. And we're going to create two of them and send them in two different messages. And what the first one is going to contain this first dark shaded region and this blue one in the middle here, highlighted there. And the second one, it's going to overlap just one VM map entry and continue on like this. So you can see you're going to create descriptors which overlap by one VM map entry. <clears throat> and then in two threads, at the same time, we're going to send these messages. So in parallel, we're going to get one VM map copy which contains all of these dark purple ones and the shaded blue VM map copy. And in a second parallel thread, because the lock keeps getting dropped, and we can do this because they don't correctly reset the state of the world, we're going to have a VM map copy which starts with this overlapping region and then contains a bunch of other VM map entries. Yeah, you can look up the actual structure that I used for the exploit on um, my team's bug tracker. You have to be a bit more fiddly about how you set these things up, but this is essentially the idea. <clears throat> and so what is actually going to happen when these two messages get received? Well, duplicate VM map entry contents implies, in this case, it's an anonymous object. So this is just the way that you get empty pages of memory that you can do stuff with that aren't backed by a file or anything else that you can uh, end map into your address space. And so the consequence of them both pointing to the same offset is that you're actually ending up with shared memory, i.e. when this first map copy gets mapped into one process and this gets mapped into a different process, they've actually ended up both having the same both having a VM map entry, which in the end will cover the same physical pages. So they've accidentally created shared memory. And we will find a way to turn accidentally created shared memory into something more useful. So then let's just quickly look at what is going to happen when these two messages are received. So first message here <coughs> will be received by the task on the left. So again, all of these VM map entries all of these VM map entries will get slotted somewhere into this virtual address space and then of, of the task on the left. And the task on the right will receive, will map this VM map copy into their address space, and they will go in there. And now these tasks have a VM map entry with the same contents, which is fine. And what it means is you have shared memory. What does the shared memory really mean? It means that in this task, if I write to this page, which I believe is in an out of line, which is in memory sent to me in an out of line descriptor in the math message, that, mem that those changes are going to be visible to the task on the right. Whereas the task on the right also believes that it's just received this, well, it has received this in an out of line descriptor, and it believes that that memory is immutable because. That is what the docs say about what a map message is. So the trick to do something interesting with this is, remember, we can send map messages to ourselves. So we create a crafted out of line descriptor overlapping region, and then we have a target that we're going to look at in a second. And we send one bit of this to the target, and we send the other bit back to ourselves, And what this then gives us the ability to do is to read and write to these pages in the out-of-line descriptor 
while the target is processing it. And that's what's going to enable us to do something interesting. So yeah, how do we exploit unexpectedly shared memory, which is, I guess, the kind of primitive that you end up with here. So this breaks the semantics that your mock message is like an envelope, i.e. you receive a letter in the post, you take out the envelope, and you expect to just be able to, if you read it twice, you read the same thing. You don't expect the contents of it to ever change. It's immutable. And this is the guarantee that um, mock messages make as well. You are just being given this as if it were copied into your address space. And it's supposed to be hidden from you, but it wasn't really copied. There was all this fancy stuff going on behind the scenes. So <clears throat> we're not done yet, though, because we need to find somewhere where breaking those semantics, i.e. breaking the fact that this is meant to be immutable, actually leads to something happening that has security impact in air quotes. We'll go quickly through. This is going to dive into a serious aside about what is security impact, but we'll quickly have a think about it. It's very difficult to define what security impact really means. Um, memory corruption is the most boring yet white accepted thing with security impact. As in, there is a great deal of research over decades that should hopefully help to convince you that if you can cause, I think I've written this in a very highfalutin way here, it is almost always possible to turn memory corruption in a target context into the ability to perform arbitrary system interactions with the trust level of the target context. I mean, memory corruption is always bad, but there are far more interesting things you can do with a primitive like, I can suddenly make memory that's not supposed to be shared memory, be shared memory. So you can imagine things like time of check, time of use in signature checking, um, which exists everywhere. There have been many cases on iOS and macOS um, of things like that. You would then have to, of course, find some place where that's happening on uh, out of line, on memory that's sent as an out of line descriptor. I didn't find any, but interesting to think about. You can think of other things like more time of check, time of use. In, for example, selector validation. <clears throat> so NSXPC, I don't know if anyone here has ever gone into the details of how NSXPC works. This is a way that you can do um, kind of very cool Objective-C magical object remoting. You can just call a selector on an object in your process, and it actually occurs in some other process mm -hmm. on the other end. And this really involves like sending a string, like a serialized string representing the selector to the other side and saying, yeah, please call the selector. I have actually looked quite deeply as to whether there could be a time check time use there, and I don't think there is. But time check time use and bytecode verification. And Luca Kuwaiti is not here. He's on a plane. But, you know, that was for him. Because there have been cases of, for example, his PlayStation 4 exploit, he was a uh, time check time use in the BPF bytecode on the uh, PlayStation 4's uh, BSD derived kernel. Mac OS BPF is far simpler than, than the other BPF implementation. So, you know, there could be a weird allocator that reuses the pages, or the list goes on. But yes, I am boring and lazy, we'll just cause memory corruption. Um, specifically, I also really wanted a bug which we can play more with pointer authentication. Um, pointer authentication is very interesting, and that's not really what the story is about. Um, and I think I'll run out of time before we get to discuss that at all. But if you're interested, there is a public blog post about how you can uh, play with one aspect of whatever the security model of pointer authentication is supposed to be, you can defeat some of it with it. So shared memory to memory corruption. So there have been bugs similar to the one I just described, been found by other people before. So in 2017, Lockie on our team at Google uh, also found this bug, the CD 2017-2456, which led to a similar style, of, similar kind of construct, where you'd end up with unexpected shared memory, because in that case, rather than, it was a different kind of trick, and you could send the out-of-line descriptor 
where the pages were backed by a mock memory entry object. And then there was just some bug where you could actually then bring the pages back from the mock memory entry object, and suddenly you had shared memory again. And so he targeted a construct in libxpc. So here is the libxpc time of check, time of use that we both, so I just copied his technique for this exploit. So <clears throat> serialized XPC message bodies, XPC, I mentioned NSXPC. NSXPC is built on top of XPC. XPC itself is a new-ish kind of, it's a serialization format. And with uh, about 10 or 12 basic types that you can serialize into a binary message, send it, in, send it into a binary buffer, send that in a mock message, and then deserialize it on the other side. The idea being to read out key value pairs of strings, dictionaries, these kind of things. So it turns out that when you read the serializer, if you try to send a large serialized XPC message, it will actually take the bulk of the data and send it in one of those out-of-line descriptors. So this means that any of the XPC deserialization code could be a target to find an unexpected time of check, time of use. Because remember, these things aren't bugs. These are just constructs that, if you had a bug that enables you to make shared memory where it shouldn't be, then all of these things become bugs. But they're not really there. And that's why none of them have been fixed, because there's nothing too fixed if you think that you're never going to create one of these situations again. <clears throat> we won't look too deep at what's going on here, but it's essentially R12 is pointing into the descriptor, into the out of line menu, which is now shared. What we're doing is strlen, adding hex 29 to that value, malloc, and then getting some offset into here and struct copying. Yeah, at offset hex 20, it struct copies from that buffer. Now, this should be. And for, for those of you who only speak ARM, um, here's the iOS version. And yes, enjoy the x86 version while it's still relevant, because uh, this will die soon. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, learn ARM64, and uh, it's all it's good. So, um, but we can also just use hex rays, and hex rays tells us, you know, still in, work out what the fields are, strip copy. So you know, there is a double fetch here, in the sense that if the memory pointed to by this changes, then struct copy is going to struct copy more than we malloc. Because this points into now our unexpectedly shared memory. <coughs> 30 seconds. We actually have a few more than 30 seconds remaining. So I can do maybe a two minute, 30 second overview of how the export actually works. So we take our cross serialized XPC dictionary that we're going to send to a tar our target. And at the end of this, we have this overlapping VM map entry. So this first region is going to get sent to our target as a serialized FTC <coughs> object. And this region is going to get sent to ourselves. So we are going to end up being able to read and write the end of this serialized FTC dictionary while the target is parsing it. So in the shared memory, the structure very simply, we have one byte, which is supposed to be null, because in XPC dictionaries, the keys, which is what we're targeting for our overflow primitive, such that strlen malloc extra copy, are supposed to be null terminated. So we have this flip a byte, which in a loop, we just really quickly flip between zero and non-zero. The idea being that we're hoping that, we'll think about this and get this right, <laughs> this strlen will see the null, malloc, and then the str copy will not see the null, and so we'll copy afterwards. So we hope that it gets malloc to be big enough 
to contain just this size, but then the copy will have this whole size. And so before that, there is some kind of heap room, the idea being that we can make something interesting happen when the overflow occurs. 10 seconds an overview of the heap room. We're going to set up a structure on the heap such that the malloc for the short string fits inside this gap we're going to create in the heap, which has before it, or any, anywhere before it, or after it, an XPC array structure. And just after our undersized buffer is going to be the actual backing store for the array. So that when we have our bad struct copy, this struct copy is off here into the first pointer in the XPC arrays back and forth. Maybe the build code for the exploit and it explains this in a lot more detail. So then what we're going to do in the sender is just as fast as we can flip this between zero and non-zero. And in the receiver, we hope this is going to happen. And if we're successful, these are XPC object pointers, and we're going to be able to corrupt an XPC object pointer and make something happen. I think I will just skip over the pointer authentication defeat. Um, essentially, the high level overview of the <coughs> Pointer authentication defeat, and I hesitate to call it a defeat because I don't think this is an intended attacker scenario for pointer authentication. You have two sets of keys, three sets of keys really, but for our purposes, two sets of keys which you can use to uh, tag pointers. And you can tag whatever pointers you want using these two keys. You have keys in this A family and keys in the B family. Keys in the B family are derived from the same cryptographic material, but for keys in the A family are derived from the same cryptographic material for all processes. So I can create an authentication code in my low privileged user space process for a pointer that will be valid in a high or different privileged process for the A key. And for the B key, I can't do that because the keys are not shared. So uh, local privilege escalation pack defeat essentially really just means I, you have to find a path that only uses pointers which are which either uses pointers which aren't authenticated or only uses pointers which are authenticated with the A family keys which in this little example here is this pack I Z A use the instruction A key with zero context value well, that doesn't have a zero context okay, I've written the wrong thing now, but Pack IA um, rather than something that uses B. Um, and it turns out that it's not too difficult to find some concepts that does that. So, all we need to find is a path in which to see object pointer control to PC control without the B key. And it's like a whole other talk just to worry about that. So, we'll, we'll skip over that. Um, so, I'll end with some final thoughts about what just happened. So, XNU virtual memory code is very old, very, very old. Um, I didn't show it that I tried to show very little code, but if you did look at some of the code and you scrolled up to the copyright, this is like 1985. So well, I've discussed publicly many times before that there is, these are seriously legacy devices, not because this is a 5X, but even like the newer ones extreme legacy fundamentals underlie all of the shininess. Um, not only is it very old, it's really horrifically complex. This might just be a necessary um, construct for virtual memory code, but it's really, really, really complicated and hard to read. Very hard to read, very hard to reason about. Extremely keen on multi-thousand line functions with like eight levels of nestedness that halfway through decide to call themselves again with other flags. Like, it's really hard to read and critical to every security boundary. It's been decades since anyone understood it. So, this is a, relative to the kind of bugs that are almost certainly in there, this is definitely low hanging fruit. I, it's quite easy to come up with here is some security guarantee, i.e., this move must be atomic, let's break it, 
find some place that they unlock the map and then try and do something while the map's unlocked. Yes, so do feel free to prove me wrong if you understand the whole thing. If you're watching the live stream and like are the dev that wrote this in 1985, I do have some things I'd like you to explain. <laughs> and finding, finding the remaining, or finding the better bugs, it requires understanding the code. Now I'm just going to have a small rant. Yes, you can still make a million dollars graphing from mCopy in iOS, and you definitely can. But virtual memory bugs are more complicated than just graphing for known bad functions. Actually, if it wasn't mempop, it was memmove, so maybe they're like Apple's um, grep is the wrong thing. Yes, even though Apple refused to do that. These stuff called virtual memory bugs are likely to live for a very long time. You trust your non luxury $999 devices causing them. That was some quote. Well, uh, a ruined version of the quote from, from uh, Craig for Google recently saying that these are non luxury devices. Yes. So um, I just said thank you to uh, Objective C for this awesome conference, and especially to Jonathan Levin and Amit Singh, who uh, without their very helpful books to sort of um, not be impossible. Yeah, thank you.